Hi, I'm John Forty. Coming up next on the St. Paul Forum, I'll be speaking with Jason Tansman of Cycles for Change. That's coming up on the St. Paul Forum. Welcome to the St. Paul Forum. I'm John Forty. With me today is Jason Tansman, co-director of Cycles for Change, and we're going to be talking bicycles. Welcome, Jason. Thanks. How's your cardio? It's good. Is it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of odd talking bicycles here, you know, what, two, three weeks from the first snow, but uh, a lot of people are biking year-round, aren't they? There are. Bicycling yeah. is a actual transportation choice for people. Certainly more people are riding in the nice weather in the spring, summer, into fall. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people, the hardy amongst us, ride year-round. Good, good. Um, before we get started about bicycles and about your organization, let's just find out a little bit about you. You, how long have you been in the Twin Cities? Sure. I moved up here about 11, 10 and a half years ago. Okay. From um, where? From a lesser place? <laughs> grew up in Chicago, okay. born and raised in the <laughs> city proper. Uh, moved up when I was 18 to go to college at McAllister College. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I graduated in 2006 and have been uh, involved at Cycles for Change since then, um, and, but really got involved in uh, bicycling and the bicycling movement um, when I was still in high school back in Chicago. Okay. And Cycles for Change, in fact, has changed its name. Yep. We used to be Sibley Bike Depot, okay. um, and we uh, completed our name change in, in February of this year. Um, our new name is Cycles and, for Change. And what do you know about Sibley? Was he the first or second governor of Minnesota? First governor He was Minnesota. the first governor. Yep. Okay. And we got the name yeah. originally for the Sibley Bike Depot because we were on Sibley Street in downtown St. Paul, where we were founded in 2001. Um, okay. And then in 2008, we moved to University Avenue at our current location, which is 712 University. Uh, and we kind of had that you know name as a um, you know staying on, but we decided we weren't really on mm -hmm. Sibley Street anymore. Mm -hmm. It made sense to change our name. And you know this is non-commercial television, so we're not here to promote you, but to yeah. illuminate what you do. Mm -hmm. But we can also promote that great restaurant right next door, which is Saigon. Saigon. It's yeah. famous for the uh, Vietnamese sandwiches. There's great bon and and, uh, and people stop by there all the time. And it's also yeah. light, right on the light rail, which is going to be a tremendous advantage for you. Yeah. Well, the light rail um, has been a somewhat controversial issue um, for the community and for the neighborhood. Um, um, uh, light rail construction has had, in some cases, a negative impact on businesses, and there was some initial community concerns that there wasn't enough protection with the new light rail line for for small businesses, for homeowners. Um, but we, as a bike and transit organization, are very excited anytime there's a new transportation investment that increases the opportunities for people who are living car free, for people who can't afford a car, mm -hmm. to be able to get around walking, biking, taking transit. Tell me a little bit more about the organization itself. How old is it? Cycles for Change um, was founded in 2001. So we were founded as the Minnesota Bicycle and Pedestrian Alliance, which was trying to be a statewide advocacy group with the Sibley Bike Depot as a commuter hub mm -hmm. on Sibley Street in downtown St. Paul. Um, pretty early on, like around 2003, the advocacy stuff wasn't happening anymore. And what we mm -hmm. were was sort of a commuter-oriented uh, bike shop space in downtown St. Paul. Um, 2006, 2007, we really re-envisioned ourselves as a community bike shop, and so we entirely and intentionally dropped the advocacy element that mm -hmm. had previously been part of our mission and really focused on free programs, helping people overcome barriers to cycling. Uh, so we began introducing free bike programs of various sorts. Um, so people could come in and volunteer hours towards, earn a fr towards earning a free bicycle. Um, and then we also introduced at that time free open shop where people can drop in, work on their own bicycle using our stand and tools free of charge um, with expert advice and, and support in making those repairs. And those, uh, that kind of shift um, we carried with us when we moved to University Avenue um, and where we are right now as Cycles for Change is really running with um, all of our programs which are based at helping people overcome whatever their barriers to using a bicycle as transportation uh, in St. Paul and Minneapolis are. Now do you have enough space because it seems like it would be I would just be a, a 
pack rat collecting bikes and bike parts and just keep filling up like you need like an acre. We, How much space do you have? We have about 3,600 square feet total, um, which includes our retail storefront, um, our shop area, our bike storage, and our offices. Um, so it's a decent size, it's a good size, but it's definitely, we have to be very intentional about kind of uh, managing the throughput. Mm -hmm. um, we have a very good relationship with Frank, our neighborhood scrapper, uh -huh. who comes by and picks up our scrap metal. Um, uh -huh. We're constantly, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that like, Maybe, could be, we love for it to be useful, but we just don't have the space for it. So, so it we're, moves down the road. Yep, yeah. exactly. It gets smelted, doesn't it? Gets it gets melted oh, down man. into you know, a refrigerator <laughs> okay. or a car. Um, <laughs> um, tell, I, I think one of the most fascinating aspects of Cycles for Change is the open shop. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. Sure, that's kind of when I think about sometimes what's the heart and soul of this organization for the last five, six years. Um, and it's our free open shop is uh, just a drop-in time. People can come in, work on their own bicycle, using our standard tools free of charge. We always have at least a couple staff members and we try to have a number of reliable, uh, skilled volunteers. And those staff and volunteers are there to help people uh, perform their own repairs, um, provide some expertise. Some number of people that come in to work on their own bike have already wrenched on bikes a lot and just need you know, a question every once in a while for something complex. A lot of people come in and need to fix a flat or adjust their brakes and have really never worked on their bike. And we really wanna be able to provide that one-on-one -on -one support and assistance to help people get back on the road. Because we know that, uh, you know, bike, you know, number one reason people don't ride a bicycle is they don't have a bike. Mm -hmm. um, another really big reason that people don't ride a bike, especially low-income communities, communities of color, is they, they have a bike that's maybe a lower quality, cheaper bike, and it has, it, it needs repairs. And they take it into a shop, and it's gonna cost 50, 60, $100 to, you know, replace the, the crank set because the pedal's stripped out of the crank, mm -hmm. um, you know, or the brakes need adjusting. Mm -hmm. That's the part you just threw away, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we always have, I mean, we have a incredible stock of used parts that we salvage from bicycles in fact, when we throw away stuff, it's usually because we have so many pedals sure. already um, that we really value and prioritize having lots of options of used items that are either free or at very low cost for people who need them. Now, the the hours of open shop are fairly limited, is that correct? How many, how many hours a week? Sure, so in the summer this year, we had open shop Wednesday, three to nine, mm -hmm. uh, Saturday noon to five, and Sunday noon to four, so mm -hmm. that was three days a week. And then we also had a women's and transgender only open shop, was mm -hmm. Tuesday six to nine, and that was just a really intentional effort to have a safe and welcoming space mm -hmm. for women and transgender mm -hmm. folks, because uh, bike shops can be very male dominated. Mm -hmm. um, so we have about 20 hours every week that are just drop-in hours for people to come and repair their own bikes. And we'd love to be open every single day from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Sure, yeah. Obviously, you know, funding and staffing and volunteer time limits our ability to do that. And uh, the space is also used for classes, is that correct? Yep. We have a variety of different classes. We have classes for adults as well as classes for youth. So we have just a basic bike maintenance class that's free for adults. We have a more intermediate mechanics class for adults that we call a complete overhaul class that works into more advanced overhaul bearings and true mm -hmm. wheels and all of that. Um, and then we have a variety of different youth classes. Um, kids can get high school credit through Gordon Parks High School, which is a neighborhood uh, public school. And then we'll work with um, various community centers like the Mount Airy Boys and Girls Club or the Kitty Anderson Youth Science Center or the Science Museum um, and youth can come in and usually it's a twice a week for four weeks class um, or twice a week for six weeks kind of depends um, and they come in the youth learn uh, it's high school age youth they learn some bike repair skills they pick out a bike and they spend the class repairing that bicycle that they get to keep with a lock and a helmet uh, we always provide our bikes with a lock and a helmet for secure bike storage and safe riding yeah and do you get a good deal on helmets you're buying helmets in bulk? Sure, we actually have a huge, um, an incredible relationship with Quality Bicycle Products, which mm -hmm. is a the largest bike parts distributor in the country, located right here in Bloomington, um, and they give us a very generous donation every year oh, nice. of just credit yeah. that we can use for locks, we can use for helmets, we can use to purchase tools to stock our shop. So uh, Steve, Gary, Chuck, Seth, everyone at QBP have just been really mm -hmm. incredible allies. Okay, here's a split ambiguous question. Do you get interest and are younger kids capable if you get kids junior high and a little bit younger? Because I bet there are kids going, let me, let me, let me. And, and do you have anything for kids, you know, age 8, 10? We don't. Um, we've been, 
as an organization, we sometimes find that we're doing a lot mm -hmm. um, for a lot of different people. I mean, we're, we're serving adults, youth, uh, we have drop-in hours, we have specific programs, we have programs local in our neighborhood, we have programs throughout St. Paul and Minneapolis. So we sometimes, unfortunately, have to make choices based on what's our funding, what's our staff capacity, um, and our volunteer capacity. So um, our kind of build a bike class with high school youth, mm -hmm. part of what makes it work is that the youth each pick out their bikes, we provide some guidance, and they really end up performing the repairs, and we're helping them, and we're double checking them, of course. Um, with younger kids, like eight and 10, it's really, you can't, you know, just, a program with younger youth requires a lot more one-to-one -one staff does it? I bet it does. Yeah. So really, what is the bottom is like 15, beginning of high school? 14, yeah. yeah 14, 14 okay. to 20 is what most of our programs okay. are for. All right. And you have actually a Build-A-Bike program. Yep. Um, well, so there's, we have our our youth program. In our, in our youth classes, there's um, kind of two main programs that we offer. One is what we call our Junior Mechanics Youth Build-A-Bike class, mm -hmm. uh, and that's We'll work with usually an organization. So we'll work with the Mount Airy Boys and Girls Club. They'll find eight or 10 or 12 youth. Um, they'll usually have a van, they'll drive them over, um, go do the class, they pick out their bikes, they work on their bikes, at the end it's, it's over. Mm -hmm. um, or we'll do that with the same program with Gordon Parks High School or we did a program with high school for the recording arts. Um, so some with some public schools, some with some kind of community nonprofit uh, agencies. And then another, our um, youth program we offer is called our Youth Apprentice Mechanic Program. And that is one where we hire eight youth, this summer we hired eight, eight youth, um, and they come in and it's an eight week program in the summer, 20 hours a week, it's paid. So the youth apply, they then get accepted based on kind of some s demonstrated skills, some interest, and, and particular interest in learning about and using bicycling and bike mechanics to, as a form of community engagement and community building. Um, so we then train those youth in bike mechanic skills. We take them to visit bike shops and bike industry locations like Quality Bike Products, Park Tool. So we're trying to um, give them some specific job training, present them uh, with an overview of jobs in the bike industry, but then also engage with them as neighborhood leaders and smart transportation ambassadors to then go to community events like the Rondo Days Parade and Celebration, the Community Peace Celebration, various kind of neighborhood events where they promote bicycling and teach their community about bicycling. Okay. In case you're just joining us, this is the St. Paul Forum. I'm John Forty. I'm speaking with Jason Tansman, co-director of Cycling for Change. And we're talking about bicycles, even though it's November, because uh, some of us are into it year-round. Yep. Um, so tell me a little bit about uh, how is Cycles for Change. Cycles for Change. I did say cycling. Cycles for Change. How does Cycles for Change um, kind of bond with a local biking culture? Because that you know, you're, you're part of, in essence, a subculture that's really... Uh, in, in ways kind of the essence of the city. So there's some interesting kind of, um, so the bicycling culture has in some ways a stronger base in Minneapolis um, than in St. Paul. So um, we definitely have like, I would say one foot in the bicycling and the bicycling culture and bicycling movement and one foot in like our neighborhood, our really, mm -hmm. you know, our, the, the handful of square blocks around where we are located. Um, the bicycling community and the bike culture in the Twin Cities, it's vibrant, it's growing, it's thriving. We've had all this new infrastructure, all these new bike lanes, new bike trails in the last two years, 10 years. I mean, 10 years ago, there was no Midtown Greenway, or maybe it was mm -hmm. 12 or 14 yeah. years ago. Um, there's really been incredible developments of infrastructure facilitating people using a bicycle as a real option for transportation. Um, and connected with that, there are a lot of people who are really diehard, dedicated cyclists. Uh, and some of these are people who don't own cars. Many of them are people who do own cars or are a one car family and just are really committed to riding, whether it's once a week for six months during the summer or every day, 365 days a year and not owning a car. Um, and so we work with people, honestly, wherever they're at. We spend a lot of time engaging and working with people who kind of aren't already the converted, if you will. Mm -hmm. Like we work um, a lot around access. So who does not have access to a bike and who are, the, who are the people that aren't using bicycles right now and how do we support them in overcoming whatever their individual and, and institutional barriers to cycling um, and helping them get the resources to use bicycle a bicycle and then connect with this really beautiful and vibrant and incredible support network that supports people in, once they get a bike, going from riding once a week, 
to riding twice a week, going from riding for two miles to riding for 10 miles. Um, and we really kind of think about how do we support people and just whatever the next step is for them, taking that step. Um, do you anticipate the infrastructure, particularly the greenways and the cycle paths, um, to be continue to be expanding over the next few years? Sure, that's an interesting question. Um, a lot of the expansion in the last kind of one to three years um, has been a result of a pretty substantial government, federal government investment in bicycling and non-motorized transportation infrastructure um, through the Bike Walk Twin Cities program, which mm -hmm. is facilitated by Transit for Livable Communities. Um, it was ended up being somewhere around $30 million over five years um, to pr from the 2005 Surface Transportation Bill um, to promote bicycling and walking. And um, that money has gone to a variety of different things. It's funded some of our work um, mm -hmm. at, for about $100,000 a year for four years now. So it's gone to, on, we're kind of on the like grassroots community building, community engagement side of things. Yeah. The majority of the money went to some really useful and important infrastructure investments. So I don't know the specific projects, but, but like things like the Bryant uh, Avenue Bike Boulevard, the River Lake Greenway, um, some of the new striping of bike lanes on Franklin Avenue, uh, on, on Riverside Avenue in Minneapolis, um, the Charles Avenue Bikeway, I think. So I, I, I know some of these Bike Walk Twin Cities funded all of, some of mm -hmm. them they funded some planning studies, but that investment, um, that, that sort of uh, um, kind of, yeah, surplus, that, that investment has really planted a lot of seeds that have really kind of uh, come home, you know, been realized in the last year or two. It'll be interesting to see how in two or three years um, as that kind of, that sort of funding well is, is pretty well ending. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, I'm not, you know, how do we continue to encourage our, our city governments to like prioritize, and our state government to prioritize bicycling and walking and transit investments instead of just roads for cars. Now I would think that the Charles Avenue bikeway yeah. would be really critical for Cycles for Change because it runs right past you. It's basically one block north of University, correct? Runs, two blocks north, yeah. yeah. Two blocks north, runs east-west. How yep. far, does it go Minneapolis in the capital or how far does it go? And is, is it part of the, the central corridor having to do with the train? Sure, so uh, the city of St. Paul approved a bike walk central corridor action plan a couple years ago. So right around the time that they were planning, and, and this was like after funding had kind of been received for, and the light rail was kind of moving forward. Um, there was a lot of conversation of how do we support people in using bicycles to connect to and ride and get to this the green line, the Central Corridor mm -hmm. Light Rail train line. Um, so the city of St. Paul approved this Bike Walk Central Corridor action plan, which basically pushed to kind of divert bicycles off of University yes. Avenue. Yes, that makes a lot. Uh, Don't compete with the trains, yes. Well, I, there was a yeah. lot of uh, a lot of bike advocates that were a little bit disappointed in uh -huh. that. A lot of people really think that when you're rebuilding a commercial strip with transit, public, public transit options, you need to also encourage bicycles to use that stretch as well. I mean, there's, there would have been, under certain configurations, enough space for a bike lane, a, car, a travel lane, mm -hmm. and the light rail yeah. running down the middle. Now, the city ended up decide, basically prioritized maintaining four lanes of traffic, two mm -hmm. lanes of traffic each way, instead of what would have had to happen, which would have been a reduction, a lane reduction, yeah. um, like a road diet. Um, yeah. to, so that comprom you know that decision was made that compromise was reached uh, a lot of the energy ended up going into sort of creating Charles Avenue as this friendly street this mm -hmm. bike boulevard um, that's going to be for bicycles for pedestrians the idea is just really slow down traffic and make it family friendly and um, help create a, a, an avenue for bikes to go basically i think from Rice Street mm -hmm. uh, near downtown St. Paul um, all the way to Pryor okay um, and then it kind of the, the bike, the <laughs> once you get to Pryor going west, it's kind of messy with all of the trains. You have to go across Amtrak routes. and yep. all that kind of stuff, yeah. <laughs> and it's probably relatively inexpensive. They're, they're putting paint on the pavement and putting up some signs. It's yeah. not, there's it, not a lot of expensive infrastructure to support that. Yeah, I don't actually know, I don't, you know, what the budget is. I mean, there are, you know, some, some, some curb changes, adding some roundabouts are kind of in the proposals. Um, and I don't know exactly how much has been funded and what hasn't. Um, fundamentally, 
bicycle infrastructure is cheap. You get a lot of bang for your buck <laughs> yes, compared to building, you know, the, the 35E expansion is like, you know, a billion dollar project or something. The new bridge over uh, uh, the St. Croix at Stillwater is like a $750 million project. Like that's one bridge, the whole light rail train line, which is also a huge project is, you know, a billion dollars. Um, so I think I think bicycling uh, is really you get a lot of a lot of bang for your buck. And and there's you know so many other social benefits, cardio and all that kind of thing yeah. we started with. Before we get there, I wanted to ask one more question. The Charles Avenue Bikeway it runs parallel to the Green Line. What bicycle is there something north south that's going to be because that seems very relevant to you. People know how to get to you along University, but going you know from from Highland North or from the North End coming south, is there a bikeway? Sure, so the city of St. Paul um, has also been moving forward with a Griggs Avenue bikeway, mm -hmm. um, and Griggs runs north-south, I believe a block west of Lexington. Okay. Um, so that's a, um, a, a, a great addition to the bike network. Um, it doesn't go, um, St. Paul has kind of for a long time lacked really effective north-south bike routes. Um, and I think the Griggs is like a partial solution, but really isn't a complete solution mm -hmm. because once you get up to like Energy Park Boulevard um, and the train tracks there, kind of running north-south, I mean, the, the streets that go through, there's Snelling, there's Lexington, there's Dale, um, and like none of those are streets that Right. I mean, like, I'm one of those 1% of people that are just going to pretty much bike anywhere, anytime. I'm a very mm -hmm. confident, very experienced bicyclist. Mm -hmm. Most people are not like me. And if we want bicycling to really be a mass transportation option, you look at cities like Copenhagen and, and Amsterdam and Münster, Germany, and, like, these cities, like, a third, half of people are riding their bicycles to work. People... For us to get there, and I think we want to get there. We, it's, 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 it's ecological, you know, we, we know global warming is happening for anyone who's following the science. Like we know it's happening and we know it's getting worse and our ability to reduce our impact, like the window is narrowing very quickly. Bicycles are a key piece of that puzzle for how we create livable, sustainable cities. Um, they you look at the rising rates of obesity in our population and especially as they affect communities of color and low income communities, um, it's, it's dramatic. They've been skyrocketing in the last 20 years. Um, and that's about, that's about eating badly and that's about uh, physical inactivity. Um, so there are, I think, investing in bicycling as a real transportation option is a very important thing for our cities to continue to do. And investing in transportation infrastructure is a really key piece. Mm -hmm. So is the really grassroots programming and access and, and education, which is kind of where we are much more in the, um, you know, we're working with individuals and communities and, and youth to try to help individuals overcome their barriers. And then we are also trying to engage with those folks who are coming through our programs and involved in our programs, getting them to turn out to public meetings saying, you know, like right now uh, there, there's a conversation and a plan to put bike lanes on Franklin Avenue between Bloomington and Hennepin, basically. And uh, we're trying to get people out th that we collaborate with and work with in Minneapolis and in the, some of those neighborhoods and say like, you know, this is something that's gonna affect your community you know, you can have a voice to help make this happen. Um, Jason, we got about four minutes left, yeah. and I want to ask you about the green bicycles put out by Blue Cross. Yeah. Is it threat? Is it opportunity? How do, how do you relate to them? Sure. So it's the Nice Ride program, which mm -hmm. uh, Blue Cross is a primary funder. Bike Walk Twin Cities was a primary funder. Um, we think bicycles are good. We're not. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't uh, see that coming. Yeah. <laughs> like we're definitely not competing with anyone. There's. Lots of work for all of us to mm -hmm. do. Um, I think the Nice Ride program has had um, a very positive impact for people who are, you know, want to take a bike ride during their lunch break in downtown Minneapolis, or who are riding from, you know, the University of Minnesota to to downtown Minneapolis or or uptown, and they've. Um, Nice Ride has tried pretty hard to also make the Nice Ride program um, accessible to some more underserved, traditionally marginalized communities in North Minneapolis and Phillips. Um, I think they've met with somewhat more limited success in that. Um, and there's a certain kind of density of stations requirement. Um, more bikes on street corners is a good thing. 
Yeah. Um, and I think that we have complementary efforts. Uh, I think there's a lot of different elements within, you know, the bike movement that are all, we're all pulling at the same rope, but we do have different kind of areas of success and expertise. Okay. We want to make sure to get your website out there, cyclesforchange.org. Yep. Okay. And in the remaining two and a half, three minutes, whatever we have left, talk about any events coming up that are happening by the end of the year. I mean, this won't air for, you know, 10 days or so, but what's, what's coming up? second half of November, December, and even into early next year. Sure. Um, we have a variety of free bike maintenance classes. You can register for those um, through the Twin Cities Experimental College, which is excotc.org. -E um, so if you have ever wanted to just learn more about how to fix and maintain your bike, you can take a four-week class on Thursday evenings. Um, so sign up for that. Um, Off-season is the best time to do it. We have our volunteer night. We're always looking for volunteers, people to come and lend a hand, help us fix up and repair bikes, organize the shop, clean the shop, that type of thing. Mondays, four to eight, uh, just drop in. No, no prior experience is required. Um, we are always looking for people with some expertise in bike repair skills. Um, we always need bicycles. So one of the things that fuels all of our programs is the availability of basically discarded bicycles, bicycles that someone is not using, that they're collecting dust in their basement or garage. You can bring them in to us, We'll take them off your hands, and we'll get them in the hands of someone who can use them. Okay, so donated bicycles, whether yeah. whether they're, you know, old and not being used, or they're just underused, yeah. you will accept them. And yeah. phone number? 651-222-2080. Uh, okay. okay. Jason, thank you very much. It's yeah. been a great pleasure. Been, Absolutely. Been, been speaking with Jason Tansman of Cycles for Change. Uh, this is the St. Paul Forum. I'm John Forty. We'll see you again next week.